Welcome to the program. I'm Jeff Sheckman. So often understanding global affairs, particularly in the Middle East, is like a game of three-card Monty. What's in view is never really a reflection of what's going on underneath. What's more, alliances, loyalties, or truth is ever shifting and always hidden. And often when the U.S. sneezes, the cards are often blown away. Such has certainly been the case in Egypt. As the Arab Spring descended on Tahrir Square in February of 2011, what once seemed like the hope for freedom and democracy gave way to ongoing authoritarianism. And like the three-card Monte game, for a while it was impossible to tell who was with who and who was on what side, including the United States. My guest, David Kirkpatrick, an international correspondent for the New York Times, led the paper's coverage of the Arab Spring, first in Tunisia and later in Egypt and Libya. He has reported from virtually everywhere in the region, but also brings the perspective of having covered Washington two presidential elections and the rise of the Christian right in the U.S. He brings us a unique and sobering perspective on the Middle East, the U.S., and the frustrations of always seeming to get it wrong in the region. His new book is Into the Hands of the Soldiers, Freedom and Chaos in Egypt and the Middle East. It is my pleasure to welcome David Kirkpatrick to the program. David, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. It's great to have you here. Seven and a half years is a long time. Take us back a little bit. Talk a little bit about the state of politics, the state of events in Egypt prior to the Arab Spring. You know, it's interesting. Uh, In retrospect, Looking back today, I think most Egyptian intellectuals would say the late years under Hosni Mubarak, who had ruled Egypt for three decades, was a, was a golden era of personal freedom, uh, broad political participation, and economic prosperity. Um, that uh, progress uh, on all fronts kind of came to a, a, a halt in 2010. For various reasons, the economy took a downturn. Mubarak reined in that political freedom, ended the political pluralism that had been allowed to flourish. And that's what really set the stage for the uprising uh, the next year in 2011. I mean, it was kicked off, of course, by events in in Tunisia. Uh, But in Egypt, against, you know, the other thing to keep in mind in the backdrop is that he, Mubarak, was getting quite old. He was in his 80s, and there was a sense that something had to give. You know, there was... Uh, an evident corruption uh, and brutality about his regime and the political freedom, uh, the freedom of expression, the modest degree of freedom of expression that he had allowed uh, made all of that very visible. So there was a sort of open cynicism about the brutality and the corruption. How much of the change that took place in that last year or two of, of Mubarak how much of it was driven by internal economic forces, as you say, and, and other forces, versus pressure and changes taking place in the region in general? Well, you know, when you look across the Arab Spring and you see a host of governments uh, toppled uh, or overturned, that is not about the arrival of new, some new and uh, dynamic force in the region. That is because all of those governments uh, had been hollowed out and weakened by their own corruption and ineffectiveness. You know, in many ways, Egypt has always been the template for the region. I mean, Gamal Abdel Nasser's uh, military takeover in 1952 really set the model for nationalist uh, authoritarian uh, autocracies uh, that prevailed around the region from then until 2011. And I think what we saw across the region in 2011 is that those that system uh, was beginning to crumble. It could no longer sustain itself. Um, certainly that's what the Obama administration said at the time. And I think what we see now is that uh, no new model, uh, no new regional order has yet replaced it. What was the biggest mistake that the U.S. made, that the Obama administration made, in, in understanding what was going on in the region, but more specifically, what was happening in Egypt? Well, one of the reasons why I wrote this book, I mean, one reason I wrote this book was to tell the story of my own sort of personal education in the Arab world. And I, I, I feel like a lot of the forces that continue to animate the region were colliding in Egypt during those tumultuous years. The other reason was to figure out what was really going on in the Obama administration. And and what I learned is that there never was one consistent policy towards Egypt, that the conflicting American uh, 
tendencies, one, to back the Egyptian military, the forces of stability, quote-unquote, the, uh, the old authoritarian order, and the other to try to back the forces of change uh, and democracy in Egypt. And those two were uh, at odds with each other throughout, and I think really hampered the effectiveness of the administration's stated policy, which was to support uh, the, the democratic uprising there. If you, if, you know, it's not my job to name uh, specific mistakes, but certainly one of them is that there was a lack of consistency uh, um, and a kind of internal contradiction to the administration's policies towards Egypt. And I think people on both sides would would say if the administration could have spoken with one voice throughout that whole period, everybody would have been better off. Would it have made a difference on the ground in Egypt? And if so, how? You know, I can't say for sure that if America had done X, Y would have happened in Egypt. Uh, but at the same time, uh, the U.S. provides Egypt $1.3 billion a year in military aid, and that has continued. So one reason why I want to look at the American role is we are, to a certain extent, implicated. You know, the, the, the Egyptian government is very close to the American government. We continue to train Egyptian military officers. After 2011, after the military uh, declined to crush the uh, uh, protests in Tahrir Square, and went along with the removal of Hosni Mubarak, the American uh, military officials, the Pentagon, was crowing all over the place about how our aid and our training of Egyptian officers and our close ties had allowed them to influence the Egyptian military in a positive direction towards embracing democracy. After 2011, I mean, I'm sorry, after 2013, when the same Egyptian military removed Egypt's first freely elected president, and went on to kill uh, hundreds, uh, more than a thousand people in the street, you heard a lot less from the American military about their influence with the Egyptians. Talk a little bit about the election of Marcy and and how, what drove that, how that played out. Uh, after 2011, uh, the, uh, the generals who had sort of taken the keys from Hosni Mubarak pledged to hold elections, and they came through. They did hold a series of free elections. There was a lower chamber of parliament elected. There was an upper chamber of parliament elected. Both of those elections were widely acknowledged to be credible and fair and full of suspense. And then there was a presidential election. It was a little bit funky. Uh, a committee in charge kept disqualifying many of the most promising and popular candidates uh, along the way, uh, which lent a kind of bizarreness to the electoral process, but it, 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 you know they, they knocked out the most, quali- the most appealing Islamist, they knocked out the most appealing authoritarian, so you were left with kind of a cast of also-rans uh, when it um, uh, came time to the election. And, but nonetheless, the final round was a former general against a member of the Muslim Brotherhood. And uh, that election was relatively open uh, and really, I think, we have to say fair. Uh, And President uh, Mohamed Morsi narrowly defeated uh, the former general. Uh, So he became the first freely elected president of Egypt. He was a Muslim brother, and I think for a lot of people in the American government, that gave them a certain amount of pause. it's interesting to note one of the one of the episodes that I detail in the book. There was uh, an American awareness of an attempt by forces within the Egyptian government to rig that election against Morsi, even when it was unfolding. There was a long delay in announcing the final results, uh, and it was clear uh, it was suspected in the streets of Egypt. It was clear inside the White House that forces within the Egyptian government and the Egyptian military were inclined to rig it uh, in favor of the former general. The American government at that time did everything they could to stop that. So the American government played a role, uh, really, in helping uh, get Morsi to power by encouraging the Egyptian government to recognize uh, the results of that election and telling other powers in the region, like Saudi Arabia and the Emirates, to, to butt out, you know, to try to let the election go forward. And yet, almost from the time he was elected, there were many voices within the Obama administration that were, were very opposed to Morsi and wanted him out. You know, it's true in retrospect that 
quite a few people inside the administration will say, well, I always knew the Brotherhood was trouble. Uh, if you roll back, uh, th- there was a moment when Morsi appeared to win them over. You know, there were, yes, for sure, there were many in the Pentagon who were, who were terrified that an Islamist, you know, somebody from a, a movement with a long history of anti-Western rhetoric, had come to power. Bizarrely, there were people in the Pentagon and other parts of the government who suspected that uh, Morsi might be in cahoots somehow with Iran. Uh, which, and the reason that's bizarre is the Brotherhood is a Sunni movement and Iran is a Shiite uh, 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 theocracy. So, it, you know, it doesn't really stand up on close inspection, but those were the fears. And yet, in the fall of 2012, Morsi really worked very closely with President Obama to try to bring about a peace treaty between Hamas and Israel. And he showed himself to be pragmatic. He recognized Israel's concern. He worked uh, closely with the Americans. And he limited what, what could have been a long uh, and bloody war to, to just a week. And even skeptics, even people who were sort of innately suspicious of political Islam inside the White House began to think, all right, we can work with this guy. This isn't going to be so bad after all. And what happened to change that? Well, you know, that's, I wrote a whole book about that. Right. So it's it's hard to break it down, but you know several things. Uh, Morsi was not the most competent governor. You know we we cannot say there's evidence that he was trying to establish a theocracy. He didn't do anything. He didn't do much while in power, but he didn't do anything uh, theocratic. Uh, however, he was not a, a very effective leader. He wasn't a great speaker. He didn't have an instinct for power. He made a number of ham-fisted moves. He got involved in clashes with uh, parts of the Egyptian judiciary who were perhaps nostalgic for the old regime and all of this made him look bad so he alienated some people I'm not gonna I'm not gonna say he's he's blameless in his demise uh, and yet at the same time we also have to bear in mind that the the personnel and the structure of the Egyptian state under Mubarak remained in place it remained in place and it was actively working against him that includes the intelligence agencies who I believe were stirring up trouble on the streets under Morsi, and there's some discussion of that in the book, the police, the rank and file, who should have been upholding public order, basically uh, walked off the job and weren't doing a thing, uh, so there was a kind of deterioration. And then in the background, you've got Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates uh, lobbying uh, and propagandizing against Morsi in Washington and around the region and inside of Egypt. So... Uh, it's true that he did not help himself as much as he might have. At the same time, a lot uh, was stacked against him uh, that kind of laid the groundwork uh, for the Egyptian military to push him out after just one year in office. Talk a little bit about the relationship between Morsi and Obama. You talk about that, what what I guess was the final phone call that they had. Yeah, so as I, as we were discussing a minute ago, you know, the two of them worked pretty closely together, uh, back and forth, a number of phone calls to try to work out this peace between Israel and Hamas, with Obama working on the Israeli side and Morsi working on the Hamas side. I mean, Hamas is kind of a spin-off of the, of the Muslim Brotherhood, so he had, he had strong connections there. And after that, uh, I, I think they, uh, they felt like they got along. Uh, certainly that's what I heard from both sides at the time. And in the final hours, the final days before Morsi was removed, from power, Obama was on the phone with Morsi trying to coach him about how he could survive. And the message was, if you reach out to your civilian opponents and bring them in, if you try to compromise and form some kind of a unity government, you, you might be able to hold on, and I hope that you do. It was evidently an earnest phone call from President Obama. He even uh, cited the example of Nelson Mandela. Obama had just been to visit Mandela on his sickbed in South Africa, and he said to Morsi, look, take Mandela as your model. Look at the unity government he formed after apartheid. That's how you might be able to pull it out. Uh, In retrospect, that looks fairly out of touch. Uh, At that time, American-made F-16s flown by the Egyptian Air Force were already painting hearts in the sky over downtown Cairo over the anti-Morsi protests. It's clear that the coup... Uh, was already in motion, and many in the American government were signaling that they were ready to support it, Uh, either signaling that they didn't think Morsi's rule was tenable anymore, 
or that they felt the most important thing was supporting the long-term relationship with the uh, Egyptian military, or even that they just thought it was a good idea. The Americans had pretty clear idea, as, as you say, that this coup was coming. In fact, pretty early on, you talk about some memos and some information that that Secretary of Defense Hagel had, that Ambassador Ann Patterson had. There was there was clear indication this coup was coming. Was there anything that the U.S. could have done about it? Well, I will. I should say I think the the warnings from Ambassador Patterson were in the nature of a coup attempt is coming. You know, I don't think anybody knew it was going to be successful until it was successful, uh, for sure. You know, if you look at just what recently happened in Turkey, where there was an attempted coup against President Erdogan, it's hard to really know if it's going to, if it's going to be pulled off. Um, one thing that stuck out to me looking back at this is nobody really warned Morsi. Morsi was surprised. Morsi, who was the elected president of Egypt, the member of the Muslim Brotherhood, trusted his secretary of defense, Abdel Fattah Sisi. He trusted him right up until the last 24 hours. It, nobody in the American government pulled him aside and said, you really shouldn't trust Abdel Fattah Sisi. And that, I think, is one reason why Morsi allowed himself to be moved into a military facility ostensibly for his own protection in the days before the coup, and why he was caught really unaware uh, right down to the last couple of days. You also talk about conversations that went on, lines of communication that existed between Jim Mattis, who was the head of Central Command at the time, and, and Mike Flynn to the Egyptian military. Yes. Uh, you know, Mattis is interesting because during the period between his uniformed service and his current role as Secretary of Defense under President Donald Trump, he gave some public speeches. And he looked back on events in Egypt. Of course, he was, you know, he had his central command at the time and in close contact with the Egyptian military and flew in and met with General Abdel Fattah Sisi. Uh, when he looked back at that period, Mattis pretty much blamed Morsi for his own demise. He said, you know, it was Morsi's quote unquote imperious leadership. You know, the problem was Morsi. The Egyptian people were tired of that kind of imperialist leadership, and they threw him out. And he's always made it clear that he is troubled by uh, all varieties of political Islam. You know, the Muslim Brotherhood, Morsi's movement, uh, was calling for elections, embraced uh, uh, pluralistic politics as they were occurring in Egypt, uh, always denounced the violence of al-Qaeda, and al-Qaeda in turn denounced the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, and yet, for Mattis, they're all the same kind of thing. You know, in, in those speeches, he says they're all swimming in the same sea. So he was somebody who was fairly phobic of political Islam, inclined to blame Morsi and thought that Morsi brought about his own downfall. Now, uh, he is really a, a very full-throated supporter of Abdel Fattah Sisi. Abdel Fattah Sisi, the current president, then the defense minister, is much more of a strong man than Morsi ever was, uh, and a more authoritarian leader than Mubarak was, really. And yet, Mattis, uh, in his speeches, says, if we want to support democracy in Egypt, if we want to support civil society in Egypt, uh, the only thing we can do is support President Sisi. And he's added to that that one reason to support President Sisi is because he's trying to curb some of the quote-unquote negatives about Islam. You know, President Sisi has talked about a reform to the way that Islam is, is discussed. What he means by that is a pretty top-down approach. Uh, 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 where all Islamic uh, thought is is sort of controlled or shaped by the state-sponsored institutions. Um, but that clearly has struck a chord with uh, uh, Secretary Mattis. Why was John Kerry such a big supporter, so it seemed, of the coup and, and ultimately of Sisi? Well, Secretary uh, of State Kerry uh, came to conclusion early on that uh, Morsi couldn't cut it. You know, almost from his first meeting with Morsi, uh, Secretary of State Kerry was very focused on the need for economic reforms in Egypt, uh, on a an IMF package and a, a set of painful cuts to subsidies or tax increases that would, you know, pave the way to opening up the Egyptian economy. Um, and he felt like Morsi wasn't grasping the urgency of that. Morsi, in his defense, 
said to Kerry, "Look, we don't, we don't, we don't have a, we don't have a parliament right now. The courts have struck down the parliament. I need to have a, a legislature that can take these decisions with me." Uh, you're asking me to, to really throw myself on the sword here because this is going to cause a lot of pain to the country, and I'm going to take the hit. Um, and I think probably there were people in the State Department who were sort of hoping that Morsi would take the hit and that he would be voted out of office. Um, but that led to a, a great frustration on the part of Secretary of State Kerry. He's somebody who I think w- will tell you he was always suspicious of the Muslim Brotherhood, that he never thought they could really be uh, fully trusted. Uh, and he's also somebody who's fairly close to many leaders in the Persian Gulf uh, who were among the most vehement uh, anti-Brotherhood uh, uh, forces, you know. And it must be said also, we're, we're quite concerned about the spread of democracy as well. You know, they didn't like the Muslim Brotherhood. They also didn't like elections. Uh, and so the Saudi Arabia, uh, the Emiratis, you know, were very close to carry uh, and they took a very, very dim view of the political opening in Egypt. There were some, though, within the administration that thought the coup was a bad idea and really supported Morsi. People let you talk about, like Ben Rhodes and Samantha Powers. How did those divisions play out in the administration? Well, I think many people uh, in the administration, when you talk to them now, will say, you know, the truth is there was never a single policy. Uh, towards Egypt. There was always more than one Egypt policy, and they were at war uh, with each other. Um, and I think that one of the problems that emerges in the book is that there, there, there was never a... Uh, they never had it out. Uh, those differences were never resolved. Uh, and so the two different policies operated roughly uh, side by side. You know, there's an important meeting the day after the coup. Obama convenes a meeting in the White House. What should we do about this? And Obama opens the meeting by saying, well, obviously we can't call this a coup. Uh, American law would require us to cut off military aid in Egypt, and we can't do that. Uh, And in that context, um, uh, somebody else in the room, um, Phil Gordon, uh, opens it up and says, you know, Mr. President, if we called it a coup and cut off military aid, we wouldn't have to call for the restoration of Mohamed Morsi. We could just call for uh, elections, and once they once they restored democracy, we could we could restore the aid. And then Obama's interested, and the conversation opens up, and they toss it around. And uh, interestingly, you know, uh, uh, General uh, Dempsey, Martin Dempsey, surprised the crowd a little bit. You, the, the the predictable role for American generals is to stick with their Egyptian counterparts with whom they'd worked so closely over the years. And he said, if we don't call it a coup, are we going to risk our credibility? I mean, uh, I'm paraphrasing here, but he basically said, look, when I was in military school, they told us not to remove an elected government. Isn't that what just happened here? And they tossed it around for a little while. And the overwhelming consensus uh, emerges that they're not going to call it a coup that they basically have to go along because of the strategic importance of Egypt. So when push came to shove, it was a fairly one-sided debate. Talk a little bit about how this played out on the ground in Egypt and among the Egyptian people, particularly, and you spend a lot of time talking about the role of women in in Egypt and in a lot of the the efforts of both the Arab Spring and what came after. Uh, Thank you for noticing. Uh, You know, I'm... I'm quite proud of the discussion of the women's movement in the book uh, because I feel like the dynamics there are are, are insufficiently understood uh, in the West. It, it, it gets tricky because the, you know the Mubarak regime had set up a national council for women, uh, headed by Suzanne Mubarak, uh, the, the first lady of, of Egypt, and that institution run by the government and supporting the government handed down a variety of uh, legal or on paper reforms that benefited women. Changes to the divorce laws, changes to some of the family laws, uh, criminalization of uh, female genital mutilation, which is an incredibly widespread phenomenon in Egypt. They didn't have much effect on the culture. And being a pro-government organization, a part of the government, that they could never really criticize the police. They could never really criticize the military. They could never really criticize the enforcement or the double standards inside the Egyptian government. And the government made any other feminism almost impossible. They did their best to outlaw uh, any independent feminist movement. So what you had was state feminism. 
And that was the only feminism until Mubarak was toppled. And then during that brief interregnum, there was really quite a flowering of uh, independent women's organizing and a grassroots women's movement that was trying to broadly change the culture and empower women, not only in Cairo, but around the country, and uh, push back against uh, the police and against abuses of women by the police and by the military. There was an episode in late 2012 when a woman in Nabaya uh, was caught in a stampede of protesters running away from the soldiers. The soldiers grabbed her, uh, threw her on the ground, uh, ripped off her abaya, covered her face, and you saw her blue bra and underwear. And they were kicking her uh, and beating her and then dragged her limp body over to the side and just left her there. And this kind of thing, honestly was fairly common. And soldiers and police knew that they could beat up female Egyptian activists with impunity because in Egypt's patriarchal culture, complaining about your uh, abuse or exposure like that would bring shame on the woman. What made things different uh, after the uprising in 2011 was the, op- the new openness of the media uh, and the sense of empowerment of women in Egypt. And in this case, that it was caught on film. And the footage of that episode, the still photographs and the, and the YouTube video, really galvanized Egyptian women in a way that was historic. Uh, the backlash against that episode, the Blue Bra Woman episode, was like nothing Egypt or the Arab world had seen in decades. There were tens of thousands of women marching through the streets of Cairo, and they forced the generals to apologize, which was you know, really very rare uh, at that time. It was, a, it was a, just a breathtaking manifestation of women's political activism by women of all stripes. Uh, now, under uh, General Sisi, now President Sisi, that has been eliminated completely. Uh, the young women who were leaders of that independent women's movement are, uh, the most significant of them is awaiting arrest. Her assets have been frozen. Um, recently in May, uh, one woman named Namal Fassi uh, posted a, a Facebook video complaining of the routine sexual harassment that she suffered in the street uh, just on a trip to the bank. And for that crime, uh, she was arrested and remains in jail. She has been charged with sedition, with calling for the overthrow of the regime, uh, and for spreading fake news. So that is the, the state of the women's movement in Egypt today. And I, I find it very difficult to convey uh, to Westerners that there's been a real loss uh, for uh, the women's movement in Egypt with the overthrow of Egypt's uh, first freely elected president, even though he happened to be an Islamist. And we're just about out of time, but but quickly, where what is the state of, of Sisi's government today, and how has he evolved? How has he changed since he came to power? You know, I find the evolution of his public persona to be one of the most interesting uh, parts of the story. Under Morsi, uh, Sisi, then the defense minister, was conspicuously humble. You know, he was often seen walking a few paces behind Morsi with his head bowed or sitting meekly next to him. He told uh, American officials and friends that he was happy to serve under an elected president, even if it was an Islamist. After the, uh, the, the military takeover... Sisi was initially almost apologetic about having to do it, but over time, he grew more and more uh, self-aggrandizing. He began to say to the Americans, look, I always told you, you could never trust these Muslim brothers. Uh, And he began to echo the refrain that it was me or chaos, that I had to intervene to save Egypt. And you know, five years later, that's still pretty much his only party platform. Um... He, you know, nobody, his speeches again and again emphasize, I'm the only thing between Egypt and chaos. Only listen to me. I'm the only, I saved Egypt. I had to do it. And I'm the only one who can do it. Now, has he brought stability to the country? Yes and no. I don't think anybody is forecasting his imminent uh, demise. Uh, At the same time, uh, his government has been unable to quell uh, an insurgency, a militant Islamist insurgency that has sprung up in the North Sinai, uh, five years on. And in his most recent election, he appeared remarkably thin-skinned. You know, he arrested anybody who even began to pose the mildest challenge to his re-election, uh, 
so that he was able to uh, win that election with about 98 percent of the vote. So he's nobody's model of uh, perfect strength, uh, and yet it doesn't look like he's going anywhere. David Kirkpatrick, the book is Into the Hands of the Soldiers, Freedom and Chaos in Egypt and the Middle East. David, I thank you so much for spending time with us. It was a great pleasure. Thank you.